Hello, I'm Sean Murray, and this is The Conversation, where we take an alternative look at political events and current affairs through an Irish lens. In this show, we hope to pick, probe, investigate, and uncover the stories that you want to hear. We go where mainstream won't go. This week, we talk to a man that defied all odds after he was seriously injured during a gun and bomb attack that killed three of his fellow band members in July 1975. Going on to become a beacon of reconciliation, my next guest has embodied the essence of the Irish peace process. But before we speak to our next guest, let's get a quick overview on this week's topic. So let's introduce today's guest. Joining me today is Steve Travers, a former bass guitarist in the Miami show band. Steve survived a horrific attack by the Loyalist Paramilitary Group, the Ulster Volunteer Force, that took the lives of his three friends and bandmates. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sean. It's nice to be here. Now, I usually begin by asking the generic question of, of your childhood growing up, but I would like to get to the crux of, of, of our conversation sure. today, which is the story of what had happened on the, the 31st of July, 1975. Sure. Um, well, like most um, young fellas growing up in the 60s, we all wanted to be the Beatles. We wanted to join the Beatles and be pop stars. And um, as far as living, I was living down in Carrick Insure in South Tipperary, so as far as the, uh, the North was concerned, it may as well have been the North Pole. Um, to my shame, we say that now. Uh, but um, I started playing and it was the easiest thing that I ever did. Uh, it was easier than, than having a real job. And so uh, I was headhunted by a number of, of bands and uh, one of them was the Miami Show Band. The band was a huge band, it had been going for a long time, but they changed the, the lineup over the years. You know, people used to come and go. Uh, it was an institution really, that band. Uh, our lead singer, Fran O'Toole, was, uh, was uh, your archetypical sort of pop pop star, and um, the band was also doing its own material. So it was an attractive thing for me to join that band, uh, and uh, hit the ground running really in uh, start of June, uh, nineteen seventy-five. And we were being the summer the summertime. We would have been playing six, seven nights a week. Um, <coughs> And Anne and I had just, we, we'd been married the year before. You know, it's, it's, it's all, almost like a honeymoon period when you join a band like that and you get to know new friends and everybody is friendly. And we were, uh, I always like to emphasize the fact that we were a mixed band. We were Catholics and Protestants from North and South. Uh, although I had no idea who was, you know, I mean, obviously the accents would give the likes of Ray and Des and Brian away because he, clearly they were from the North. But with regard to religion or politics, or anything, I had no idea what anybody was, you know. And um, we were, were playing and um, I remember that particular weekend, uh, the weekend, last weekend, I suppose, really in July 75, We'd been playing at the Galway races and we had been playing there. We played there on the Monday and the Tuesday. When we got home after the two nights, we, um, we would normally have the Tuesday off, but because we were playing on the Monday and Tuesday, the night that we were due to have off, we'd like to have one night off a week, but the night we were due to have off was the Thursday night. Uh, but we still had one gig to do, and that was in Banbridge. Uh, in, um, in County Down, just just north of, of of Newry, there was plans already set, well set in 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 motion, um, to to try to frame the band, uh, the members of the band, as uh, uh, running guns basically or bombs or whatever it was uh, for for uh, the IRA. So we would have been. It was a false flag operation, uh, obviously, and. Um, we finished the dance. Ray went home to Antrim uh, 
on, in his own car because we had the following night off, the Thursday night off. So there's five of us got back into the minibus. We had a Volkswagen minibus uh, for the personnel. We didn't travel with the equipment. The only equipment we carried was our, our guitar. So Tony Garrity uh, and I, Tony was a lead player, I was a bass player, and we carried our equipment. Sometimes we would have brought Des's, Des McAleese, well Des Lee as he called himself, his saxophone with him. Um, and we, that was the case that night. So it was Tony's guitar, my guitar, and Des's guitar. And if you, if you know the, the way uh, they're constructed, those um, Volkswagen mini, minibuses, there's, the engine is in the back and there's a little shelf at the back so you can lift the uh, window over the engine. And there was a little shelf and that's where we used to put those instruments. We wouldn't give our guitars to the roadie because roadies are inclined to throw stuff into the van and you know it's a bit like the, the, somebody working in an airline you know with your case uh, you couldn't be sure so we were precious about them and um, we, were, we were in good form because it's a relatively short journey from from uh, Banbridge to Dublin we were we were based in Dublin and normally uh, some of the lads if it's a, a, a longish journey the lads would they'd be nodding off after a while you know and I was a bit of a an insomniac, so I would always sit up beside Brian, Mc Brian McCoy, who was our trumpet player, and Brian was uh, always drove the personnel van as well. He kept it at home, and um, so we. Uh, but because everybody was was wide awake and they had no intention of sleeping on the way home, uh, I climbed back into the back to chat with Tony. We were talking about guitars. We were about six miles from north of Newry at this time. We weren't long out of Banbridge. Brian turned back to us and said, uh, uh, we've got to stop, there's a, a roadblock. And you'd come across these, in 1975, the troubles were, were raging. So uh, um, you, we knew the drill, at least the lads, I, I, was, I was the least experienced uh, traveling in the north and with stops and roadblocks, but the lads knew the drill and I got to know them very quickly. Y you stopped, turned on your interior lights, you turned off your main lights, you let your side lights on and you approached when you're told to approach. Uh, there was a man with a red torch. On this particular time, uh, we were surprised that Brian said, almost apologetically, he was a real gentleman, Brian, and uh, he said, That's, we've got to get out. These gentlemen want to do a check on the van. And for me, being the new recruit from way down south in South Tipperary, you know, I thought this was a big adventure. And it was. You know, it was something that uh, you know, go home and tell Anne, you know what, we were stopped with a man, by a man with a gun or whatever, you know, but um, there's a sliding door on the, uh, on, on the side of, a mini of the Volkswagen minibus. You just pull it across and the lads piled out and I was the last one out. Um, and um, as I got out, I noticed that there was a, a number of soldiers there. Now, I wouldn't have known one uniform from another um, but uh, th these were all sort of a, a darkish type of uniform and apparently this was UDR uniforms that they were wearing. And um, some of the men were hunkered down. Or they were all friendly, to be honest with you. Um, and they told us to line up uh, facing the, the hedge. And at the hedge there was, um, there was a drop of about three metres down into, in, into the field in front of us. And they told us to put our hands on our heads. It was just, you know, intertwine your fingers and put, put your hands on Yeah, This was just adding to the adventure for me. And uh, as I say, there was five of us. Ray was gone home. So I was in the middle. And Tony Garrity, our guitar player, was on my left. And Fran was on his left. And then on my right, uh, Des McAuley, Des Lee was on... Uh, no, actually, Brian McCoy was, was on my right and Des was on his, on his right. And Des was in, you know, touching, touching distance of the back of the, the van. That's how close we were to it. And uh, there were, there was banter between the soldiers and, and ourselves. And they were saying, uh, one of them, I remember one of them said, uh, I bet you lads would rather be at home in bed than standing out here at the side of the road. And Fran, Fran O'Toole, our, our singer, was a witty fella. And uh, he said, I bet you lads would rather be at home in bed than than sitting in a ditch because some of them were hunkering down. And I was fascinated by the, the guns they had, these sort of rifles with perforated barrels. I think they were submachine guns or something like that. Uh, 
and, and one was laying across this man's uh, legs and as I say he was hunkered down the, there was a, another man who seemed to be in charge and um, and he was giving the orders and there was another man there the man that I think he may have been the person that stopped us and told us to pull in um, he had a notebook and just before we pulled in there was a car coming up behind us and, and when he told us to to get out Brian said can I pull into the side of the road there's a car coming up uh, fast behind us and he told us yeah that's fine so we're standing there and, and, um, and everything was very relaxed and the man in charge told the man with the notebook to get our names and addresses and uh, so he started at, at, at Fran and um, he asked Fran his name and address and Fran was giving it to him. He was about to ask Tony his, uh, his name and this, this an, another man appeared on the scene and um, I hadn't seen him. No, I'm not sure if he arrived in the car that was pulling up, uh, coming up behind us because that particular car never passed us. And, um, but this man, when he arrived, uh, everything changed, the atmosphere changed and uh, he had uh, a lighter colour fatigues on him uh, and, and it was actually fascinating cause, because he had a, a, a side arm and he had a lighter colour berry, so like a, sort of like a, a fawn colour berry as opposed to the green ones that the other men were using, uh, had had. And he asked, he asked the man who appeared to be in charge what the man with the notebook was doing. And the minute he started to talk, I recognised, you know, this is, this is an Englishman. And um, the men that were hunkered down were standing up now and everybody was, it, it, it appeared as, as if they were more professional. And this man definitely took charge. And I was just fascinated by this, this soldier who was, who was uh, made everything that, that bit sort of uh, more professional. And as I say, Brian, McCoy was standing beside me and he, he nudged my elbow with his and uh, he said uh, this is British Army and uh, what he meant was was that you know this would be done professionally and I heard a click they had opened the back of our van the, that little shelf and I heard a click this was uh, just ac actually just before the man arrived I heard this click and it, they were opening the guitar cases and I'll tell you how, you know, I didn't take it seriously. I took my hands down and I turned around and I walked back to the back of the, the minibus. And I said to him, can I help you with that? I didn't want them touching. I had a very unusual guitar. It was, a, it was a, a, called a Dan Armstrong bass. It was a, a, a plexiglass. You could see through it. It was like a glass bass. And there was only about four of them in the country. Um, Phil, Phil Linnett had one. Brush Shields had one, I had one. There was about, there was about four of us had them uh, and we were precious about them, you know. And so uh, he, uh, th there was two men at the back and, and, and they pointed at a little case. I had a little, like a little school, like a little brown school case type thing. And they said, uh, what's in that? I said, it's uh, um, effects pedals. It was un unusual enough for a bass player to be using effects pedals in 75, but I had a wah-wah pedal and an octave divider, w which was called a color sound octavider. And, uh, and he said, uh, are there any val valuables in them? And I said, no, I was, I was surprised that you would even ask that. But in hindsight, I think maybe he was asking where the, you know, was the take the money from the gig or something? I don't know what he, what he meant, but we wouldn't have been carrying that. The roadie would have done all that. Um, and when I said no, he turned me around and punched me in the back and knocked me back into line. And, um, but this time, instead of being in the middle, I was, I was next to Des, it was between Des and Brian. So I was second from the van. Uh, Brian was re reassuring me and he, he nudged me and he said, this is British Army, we'll be away soon. And he actually said British Army, uh, which was important because later on we were able to verify that. Um, uh, Anyway, um, and Des chirped in as well, and both of these lads are from the north. Des is from Belfast, and Brian's from Caledon, and they would have grown up and know the you know the different accents as well. And with trained musicians' ears, they would know that this is you know this is British. Um, but uh, and he also said, 
uh, Des said the, uh, the army is usually careful with the equipment. So that was a, a comforting thing. What we didn't know was that there were two men had taken a 10 pound bomb uh, commercial explosives and they were putting it under the driver's seat. For years we thought that, the, that this thing was placed in the back, which was actually, they were placing it under the driver's seat. And um, the plan was uh, to, that we wouldn't know anything about this, this uh, bomb that they were putting under the thing. And we, they would have said, thanks very much for your cooperation. We would have driven off and according to forensics, uh, it, was, it, would have, it would have gone off between 10 and 15 minutes uh, after, we, after we left. So nobody would have known about the, uh, about the roadblock. Uh, and we would have been, people would have said, well, these fellows were carrying bombs maybe for the IRA or whatever, and um, uh, so who can we trust? And they would have put pressure then on the Irish government to have shut down, basically have more stringent security on the border. Because at the time, uh, um, you know, if, if the IRA w had maybe, the, if there was some sort of an outrage and they would have crossed over the border. They were reasonably safe because not because the Irish government wanted it like that, but because the TDs along the border counties didn't want to disrupt the normal life of people who would have been crossing the border on a daily basis for maybe petrol or groceries, which might have been cheaper at the, you know, on the northern side. And uh, so that was the reluctance. It wasn't for anything else. And, um, but it, it didn't work. The, the plan didn't work. They were using a wristwatch timing uh, mechanism. And um, for one reason or another, maybe it, maybe they tilted it the wrong way. Or I, d I, d I don't know anything about these bombs, but this thing exploded. And uh, the two unfortunate men that were planting this bomb, or if they were blown to pieces, you know, they tore the head off one person, uh, the legs off and the arms off another. But the, there, there was very little left of them, you know. Uh, I remember seeing the autopsy reports and they were, uh, uh, shocking the damage but when it went off um, as I say we were standing right beside it and he, you know the pictures there are pictures all over the place of the of, of the wreckage I mean there was little or nothing left and it, um, it lifted me up into the air and I remember you know being aware that something happened was, was happening and I often say that the whole world turned red it actually that's what it looked like to me and maybe it was the flames or whatever. Um, and I was, I, I tried to run, but I was in the air, so there was no, I couldn't get any purchase on my feet, you know, and uh, I could hear guns going off. It was like, it was, uh, as if I was in slow motion. I was just raised up into the air, and then I started to go down through the ditch. As I say, there was about a three meter drop into the field. And as I was going down through the ditch, I felt, almost like like time was 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 coming to a stop and uh, even through my clothes i could count every single leaf and bramble and every single thing that that i was touching like uh, now whether that's a heightened uh, awareness through from adrenaline or adrenaline or something like that, i don't know but uh, i was i was very aware of all of that and then all of a sudden uh, time went back to normal and I hit the ground very hard uh, and instantly there was two more people fell on top of me and I think it may well have been uh, Tony and Fran. Now Des was blown through a separate, there was a trees and he was blown separately uh, off a bit to the right uh, so there was the two lads fell on top of me and um, and somebody then put their arms, uh, their hands under my arm. Apparently I was shot while I was in the air. Uh, I didn't, I, I wasn't, re I didn't realize I was shot, but I was shot with uh, what they call a dum dum bullet, which is specifically designed to explode on impact. And it, it hit me just over my right hip. And when it entered my body, it exploded into 17 pieces. So it was, an ex these things explode when they, and and it, it did a lot of internal damage, and then part of it continued on, and it 
through my left lung and out under my, my left arm. So it went right across the body. And somebody put their hands under my arms and started to, to drag me, uh, maybe to try to get me to stand up, but I was a dead weight at that stage. And, um, and while he was, uh, I, I'm very reluctant to say it was Brian, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain it was Brian McCoy. Brian McCoy. Um, uh, and the reason I'm reluctant to say it is because I feel guilty that he was murdered dragging me, uh, uh, trying to drag me away from the thing. And he was a you know, Protestant lad from Caledon in County Tyrone, and, and uh, I'm a Catholic from South Tipperary, and he's dragging me out, uh, uh, out, trying to drag me away from what's happening. And he was shot in the head and the back, and because the soldiers jumped down after us and started to, started to, to kill everybody, started to shoot everybody. And um, so Brian was lying beside me, and I was lying on the ground, and I, I, I kept my I kept my face to the side. I always remember that my cheek and the grass, uh, just lying down, wondering what was happening. And I could hear the others. The soldiers then caught up with Fran and uh, and uh, and Tony, and they didn't get very far. They tried to run away, but they, um, I, I could hear the, the 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 crying and the begging for you know. And and Fran was lying on the ground, and he was facing them, and. He's you know, asking him not to kill him, and they stood over him, and they shot Fran, our singer, 22 times, and seven of those were in the face. Uh, he was partic particularly good-looking young lad, you know, and um, and um, and shot Tony in the back of the head, and um, a number of times as well. And uh, one of the things that stands out for me was the obscenities, the the cursing and the swearing, the shouting and roaring of the soldiers, like real anger, you know, that was qu quite frightening, you know. And uh, when the shooting stopped then, um, I could hear uh, at least one soldier was walking around and he was firing into the bodies to make sure they were dead, but they were well dead. And uh, he walked over and Brian was, was lying beside me. And Brian was dead as well and he started kicking Brian ferociously. He was like, giving I'm really kicking into him and uh, and and shouting and screaming, and then he walked. I was like about two feet away from that, and he turned to me and he stood over me, and um, I was uh, I wondered, will I get up? Will, will I beg? You know, will I ask him not to? But I had heard it didn't do the lads a whole lot of good, you know. So I d I, I just stayed quiet and. Um, I thought he was going to fire into me, and I was saying to myself, "This will be quick." Uh, and just as he stood over me, and he had a pistol, um, the, somebody on on the road shouted down, "Come on, those bastards are dead! I got them with dum dums." I didn't know what a dum dum was, but I heard him say that very clearly. Des had been blown, as I say, off to the right uh, into into the field, but he was he was lying closer to the ditch. The ditch was on fire. There was a danger that he would have been burned alive, but he 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 didn't budge either. He was, but they didn't see him, and uh, so I, I still thought that when the man said those bastards are dead, I got them with them, that he, he would have. W I thought he was still going to fire because he was st still standing there, and he turned around miraculously. He started to walk away, and uh, every every f step that he took, I was saying to myself. You know, I hope he takes another step because the, the, he may not be that accurate. If you, and I was determined not to, not to shout out if he if 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 he fired. After a while, there you know they seemed to be gone, uh, and then I heard a voice calling. Uh, he said, "You know, Fran, Tony, Brian." And then I said Steve, and uh, I was the only one to answer. I was I was amazed that the other guys didn't answer. Because I was, I was expecting them to to answer, but um, they, uh, the, the, there was no, they were, they were dead, obviously, and it was it was Des, and he said, "Are you okay?" And typical Irish, <laughs> I said, uh, "I'm grand." Uh, I wasn't in pain or anything like that. I, I didn't feel anything, and so Des got up onto the road and 
as he often says, there was carnage on the road. And the, um, a, 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 a truck came down uh, a lorry and um, he asked the, the, the truck driver, I need to get into the police station to report this. But the truck driver didn't know whether he was involved in this and it wouldn't take him. And then a car came along and they had to sort of stop and manoeuvre because there was a lot of the, the, the you know, bits and pieces of the van that was all over the road. And um, it was a, a, so eventually Des got into, in, into, into the police station in Newry and um, I, was, I was trying to figure out, I rolled over on my back, I was trying to figure out what, what's just happened here. And I thought that these soldiers had been, cr had been attacked by the IRA and that we were caught in the crossfire. That's, what the, that's the only way I could figure it out because I completely trusted the soldiers. I was brought up to, whether it was a policeman or a soldier, a postman, whatever, you wore a uniform, you were a good person, you know, and you know, had to be, had to deserve, deserve respect. But it was, I always remember, this, it was absolutely beautiful, beautiful night, and I was staring up at the, uh, it was about a half moon there, and it was very warm, very warm weather. Was, but this was about, maybe about quarter past, nearly half two in the morning. And um, I was still trying to figure it out, and I was lying on my back, and I, I counted my fingers to see if, if there was any damage done. Because as a musician, obviously, it's important. I remember tapping my, my feet together, and we used to wear these ridiculous platform shoes at the time. It was the style. And I heard my, I could click my, 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 my feet together. And I knew that, that I still had my feet. Now, I don't know why it dawned on me that I should do this. Uh, but there was a terrible smell of, there's no other way to describe it, like, like meat, cooking meat. Uh, because when, if apparently, I didn't know this at the time, but if somebody is shot a number of times with a machine gun or whatever it is, it, it's, it, the bullets are so hot they actually cook the flesh. And there was a, the smell of burning blood uh, was, was terrible. And um, I, I got up, I sort of half sat up, and I was able to do that, and I turned around and I kneeled up. And uh, then I, I stood up and I noticed that my stomach was extended. I couldn't find any blood. So I said, I heard that man saying dum dums. They were, that means it was dummy bullets. That's what I, I said to myself, you know, these weren't real bullets at all. So dum dums must mean because I couldn't find any blood. For the audience to say dum dum bullets are. Explosive bullets. Yeah. Dum dum bullets are explosive. And um, uh, so all my bleeding was internal and my stomach extended out, it was, like, it was very big uh, and I couldn't figure out why that was and I still had no pain um, and I do, I, when I, I managed to stand up I fell down again and, I, and I'd stand up and I'd fall down again so I decided the best way to get around was to, was, was to crawl around on my stomach and pull myself around and sometimes I'd kneel and push myself forward. I knew there was something wrong because I found it difficult to breathe because the bullet had collapsed my left lung. And uh, so the first one, I, 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 I was able to reach out to, to Brian and I shook him. Uh, I said, Brian, are you okay? And, and there was no answer. And uh, I, t I said, he's after getting, he, he's been knocked out. You know, he's, he's out for the count. So I crawled over to, um, towards Fran and I, I, I won't say the state he was in but you know uh, I was I, I, I said to him Des is gone and he'll be back soon so and we can we'll, we'll all go home and I crawled over to Tony and uh, Tony in the case his injuries were bad he had been one of the bullets had gone, gone through the back of his head and knocked out his eye onto his cheek and it was uh, it, was, it was terrible, and, and, and uh, I said to him, um, I remember asking him, did you break a finger? I wouldn't, I, I, I just would not acknowledge uh, the, uh, the, what, I was, what I was seeing. And uh, that lasts for, for maybe forever, for a long time, that you, your mind tells you not, that this is not, you know, you're in denial, basically. 
and um, so I, uh, I, I crawled as far as the ditch and I pulled myself up. Uh, all I wanted to do was to, to get some relief because I couldn't breathe properly. And I pulled myself up onto a little branch, uh, sort of a, it was hanging towards the field. And I leaned over that to see if I could get, if I could catch my breath. But, uh, and then I'd stand up and I'd fall down again. And I remember that it was almost like a light show. There was a, the, 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 the ditch was on fire and every si time, you know, the, 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 the fire would crackle or whatever, you could, it would light up something. And, and uh, while I was crawling around, there was, uh, there was body parts on the, one of these unfortunate men, his arm was uh, was in the field, and it was um, it's like it's 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 it's, it's surreal. It's it's like a, a bad nightmare, case. and you're telling yourself you know you're just ignoring that. And uh, eventually, then um, I heard walkie-talkies. This was after about an hour. I spent about an hour crawling around the field and telling the lads that you know. Uh, uh, I, I, I said, Tony's fine. And uh, I, I, said, I said to Fran, you know, uh, Brian is, is, uh, seems to be out for the count, but Des will be back to him with help. And um, I heard these uh, walkie-talkies, and uh, I was convinced that the men had come back to, to finish off this thing. I, I heard somebody jump down into the field, and I said to myself, you know, I'm going to stand up. I'm, I'm not going to die lying down. Um, so I stood up and I faced what I could hear coming towards me, and it shone a light on my face. And uh, I remember a man saying, oh, "We're the police, son." And uh, I went to walk towards him, and the the, the ground was sort of um, it was uneven, and I actually tripped, and he caught me. There was another. There was two policemen. They caught me. They eventually got me into, uh, into the hospital and um, I remember being, they were running down this corridor with me and all the lights flying past me and they put me up on, 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 on an operating table and, and they were questioning me. There was men there questioning me and um, I don't know whether they were doctors or police or whatever it was, but they were, uh, one of them said, uh, you know, um, what happened to you? I said, uh, I fell through a ditch. So that's the only explanation I gave him. I fell through a ditch. And he said, well, you've got some s scratches and marks. He said, what are they? I said, well, the ditch. And uh, there was a, this nurse came over and she had a scissors. And she, I had a, a blue jumper on me and a sort of a black jeans. And, uh, and she said, um, I'm going to cut this now. I said, no, you're not. She said, I've got to cut this off. She had to say, I said, I just bought it last week. So I put my hands back and they gave in and they, they actually took it off me without cutting it. So I was happy enough with that. And the, these people were pointing at it. I had a small uh, wound on the right and a small wound on the left. And these were the entry and exit wounds. I just kept saying, you know, I fell through a ditch. And the, I remember the one man said, um, uh, what were you doing up here? They obviously heard my accent, which isn't, isn't Northern accent. Said, uh, said, what were you doing up here? And I said, I was playing. You know, I had no idea that they didn't know who we were, you know, because if we go into a shop, everybody knows who you are, you know. Was, uh, um, and uh, I said, well, I was playing. And uh, he said, I always remember, he said, Playing at what? So eventually, uh, I said playing music. And um, I think they started to realize this is a band. Next thing, all of these machines started to come down. I think it was x-rays or something like that, and all the banging and the noise from these. And next thing, I, I woke up uh, you know, hours, hours later, eight or nine hours later, and. Uh, it was just my wife was just standing there. She had been, they had, Billy and Marie brought, brought her up. And when they arrived at Daisy Hill Hospital, um, um, there was a lot of security and there was a lot of commotion outside Daisy Hill. And, uh, and Billy went straight over to the, the security man with a, a he had a, ch uh, 
like a, cl- a clipboard. And Billy said, we're here to see Stephen Travers. And uh, and Anne was there. She, I mean, you think about it, she was, like, she was only 21, you know, 20, 22, 21, 22. And, uh, and uh, he said, uh, Travers, Travers, as he looked down the clipboard, he said, oh yeah, he's dead. And Billy said, no, check it again. He said, we're told he's, th- th- that he's, he's, uh, that he's, he's okay. And he said, oh, my mistake, uh, he's in theatre. And um, oh my God. so eight or nine hours. But I have to say, uh, Dizzy Hill Hospital, within 24 hours, 48 hours of the whole thing happening, gave me back my, my faith in mankind. They're just amazing people, you know, amazing people. Steve, it's an extraordinary story. Uh, and no matter, no matter how many times I hear it, it's just, um, it, it stays with me. I mean, it, it's took you many years. It's taken you many years, sorry, to come to terms with what had happened. But also, you've been engaged in a journey of reconciliation from that, which is, you know, speaking to you before, has been very, very important for you. Do you want to talk about that? As you say, coming to terms with it is, 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 is important. I don't know if you ever come to terms with it. You actually accept that something happened. Um, you never quite understand it. and. Uh, and for me, it's not an extraordinary story at all. It's, it's my life. I don't know any other life. And this is the case with many victims. Uh, but for all those years, up until 2016, until we, uh, uh, a number of us got together, uh, Eugene Reevy, uh, whose three brothers were murdered on the 4th of January 1976, He's, and uh, Joe Campbell, whose father, Murdered in Cushendall, actually by the same the same man was involved the jackal the jackal Robin Jack Jackson um, uh, who was a uh, you know killer for hire and he's working for, working both with the special branch and with uh, MI5. Um, we got together. Uh, 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 there was an event in in the UK who was, who was run by Michael O'Hare, whose little sister Majel O'Hare was murdered uh, in in seventy six and. I think it was August 76. And it, it was bringing people together from both communities who had been, uh, ha- had been impacted by the troubles. Uh, one of the other speakers on that particular event, uh, his, 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 his wife had been killed in the Shankill Road bomb- bombing. And um, there, was, there was four of us uh, talking about our experiences because it's important to, to talk about these things so, so that people understand you know, the futility and, and the failure of violence. And uh, we decided that the event that was, uh, Alan McBride was the, ma- the man's name, uh, whose uh, wife Sharon was, was, was murdered in, on the Schenkel Road bombing. But um, when, when we, I began to realize, you know, there's more, uh, uh, there's more, uh, it's about other people as well as me, you know. It's it's. So I had been focusing for all of these years on myself and my own story, and then when I started to hear other people's stories. I thought, you know, well, it's important that 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 society understands what happened because it, you have to understand uh, the past. It's like, you know, people often say, well, you know, let's move on. But if you go down to to do your driving test on a, you know, and you turn up without a rear view mirror, you'll fail the test. You know, you have to know where you're, what's behind you before you can, you can navigate safely into the future. So it's important uh, that, that we know. So we started to, to understand other people's stories. First of all, I wasn't alone uh, in, in this. It wasn't, this was, this was a, a, a journey that we all had to, had to make and to come to terms with and to understand. You can't, you know, you can't excuse the things that happened. But I began to look at the word, the big word for me now is context. You know, why people do certain things. I believe that the people who, who were there on the night, and even those with the, you know, screaming and shouting the obscenities, that they actually, you know, the products of 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 uh, the times they were in. They're also products of, of 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 the society that they grew up with. And if you're bounced on your knee by your grandfather and tells you to hate the person who lives across the road because they say different prayers to the same God. You're going to believe that, you know, and, and, and this fear and all of these things. It's not excusing these things, but um, uh, uh, t- so the, the journey, the reconciliation journey started off with using the word reconciliation. And then 
we, we noticed that words like reconciliation meant different things to different people, you know. To people down in the south who uh, unfortunately know little or nothing about what happened in the north, they think reconciliation is let's build a, a you know a big expensive peace bridge in, in the north and we get both factions uh, tell them behave themselves, meet in the middle and hug each other. That's not that's not going to happen. That's not it's not feasible. It wouldn't happen anywhere. So uh, I began to understand the whole thing. So uh, and more and more, it just there was two things that just came to the fore for me. It was the first of all education. Education is to understand what happened, why it happened. It's not, it's not enough to understand what happened. You must always ask the question, why did it happen? And um, um, you know, terrible things, you know, once, once, once the killing starts and once, once somebody on either side, or, and it wasn't just two sides because it was orchestrated by, uh, as, as Tommy Sands, the great singer-songwriter, said to me one time, um, Tommy has a, a beautiful song out called There Were Roses. It's about two, two young friends, Catholic and Protestant, and we were up in his house in Ross Trevor one time, and there was lots of guitars and everything around. This was not too long ago. And I said to Tommy, sing, sing There Were Roses. And he sang it, and it brought it back, you know, the, the, because we were a mixed band. And, and I, I, I remember saying to Tommy, God, Tommy, there's terrible things done by, by both sides during the conflict. And Tommy's a wise, wise old man. And he said, um, I say, well, old, he, he won't like that. But uh, he said, um, oh, he said terrible things indeed. He said, but there was a terrible thing there in the first place to make it happen. And in my new book, I actually finish with that uh, sentence because there was an unjust, it was an unjust society, it was, it was injustice there and uh, but as I say when you know when 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 either side starts to kill the innocent and murder the innocent whether it's you know whether it's the Miami or Claudie or, or whether it's you know and it's Gillen or the or, or, or the Reeves or the O'Dowds or anything you know you can go on forever with these things but we have to say, we have to call it out and say, you know, murdering people is wrong. And it, it, but we can't say, well, you know, I'm going to blame you for this. Now I'm going to, you know, this, I'm never going to have anything to do with you. Unless there's dialogue here, we have to, you know, we have to, uh, dialogue is really, really important. We wouldn't have had the Good Friday Agreement with, without dialogue. Uh, and our organization, TARP, you can see it on tarp.ie, but it's, it, it was very, very successful in so far as it was bringing people and letting them tell their stories. But there's a danger in that as well, that it becomes a very sophisticated sort of, very sophisti sophisticated uh, what about re exercise. And you're inclined to want to balance the books. Well, if somebody here, you know, who has suffered from one uh, in one community, because neither community has a, a monopoly on suffering or loss. But you get somebody you know, you say, well, oh, we've now we've heard the story of this person. We better get somebody from the other side and hear that story. So as we, and, and that doesn't work. And it's something that, you know, in the years since we formed TARP, that trying to balance the books is, is not healthy. Absolutely. Somebody who is impacted by one side or the other is entitled to stand up and tell their story on their own. And they should be able to tell their story on their own, just as I'm doing here now. And they shouldn't have to have somebody from uh, the other side to tell their story to balance it out. Um, and the people on the other side should also be able to tell their story without having to having to. Because what happens is you get this you get this phenomenon where when you hear these stories uh, and, and you're trying to balance the books, people who are, uh, are you know especially in the south or in the UK or wherever say ah. One was as bad as another, you know, and they, they were all the same. They were all attitude. They should have got a bit of sense, and all it wasn't like that. It's it's context, and every single uh, uh, killing, every single thing, has has its own context. It didn't rely on something else, and you can't say, "And I was justified to kill somebody because somebody killed my neighbour." It isn't like that. So we have to hear individual stories. The other thing then is that, that you know, we're, as I say, cliches become this sort of firewall for us. We say, you know, we talk about uh, what happened on Bloody Sunday, but we don't mention the names of the people. 
you know, we talk about Dublin uh, bombings or the Dublin monument. We don't mention the people. We, they become a cliche. We talk about uh, uh, Omar Ennis Gillen. Uh, there are some people, you know, you'll never forget Gordon Wilson's voice. But then again, at the same, the vast majority of the people who, were, uh, who, who died during the Troubles, they become, they become uh, cliches rather than actual in individuals because there's an inconvenience for people to have to say these were real human beings. But we do have to know the stories because the alternative to it is, um, is uh, if, you know, uh, violence, as I say, it doesn't work. It's, it's, you can see it's not working anywhere in the world. And, you know, there's always, it'll go on for 100 years and another 100 years and it'll still never stop. So uh, hopefully the message comes across that the only reason I'm telling these, they're telling this story or, or, or talking about the actual horror of it is so that people will say, I don't want that for my kids. Steve, it's always great to have you in Belfast. And I wanted to do one last thing before we finish. You said you had a new book. Do you want to plug the new book? I thought, thank God for that, Sean. I thought you were going to ask me to sing a song. <laughs> 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 I was never a singer. Uh, um, or played the guitar. Um, yeah, we have, have a new book. The, the, uh, the book we, we brought out in 2007 was called, obviously, the... Uh, the Miami Show Band Massacre, a Survivor Search for the Truth. Um, and that led to the Netflix documentary. Uh, uh, so it was brought the story to uh, a global audience, like your films, Sean. I mean, there's nothing better, to, you know, the, than to get people into a theatre or, sh or show it on television. This new book is actually called The Bass Player. And the nature of a bass player, somebody who sort of stands back, at least in my, in my case, the vast majority of bass players, like to stand back and uh, lay down a groove and, and work with the drummer and not be the one that has to get out there and, uh, and, and, and front the band and smile and jump around the place and all that. We were the, the ones that stayed back. So in that context, I, 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 I hope that, you know, I'm, I'm able to maybe talk about the things that I've seen, talk about the things that were in front of me. Uh, anybody could write a book about the Miami show band massacre at this time, but uh, how how it how how it changes your life, how it uh, makes you different from the person that I began at 24, complacent, arrogant, somebody uh, you know who who couldn't care less about what was happening in the north, uh, um, to somebody who cares passionately now about about um, about what happens to our people all, uh, uh, on this island and, and, and on these islands. But it was a learning curve, and it's, it's taken me uh, next year uh, will be the will be the fiftieth anniversary, and it's taken me this long to realise that every single incident, my uh, my experience, everybody's experience, whether it's you know all of these well-known uh, uh, atrocities or whether it's the ones that people never get a, an opportunity to speak about, you know, they're all connected. We're all connected, and uh, uh, together. I think there's no better antidote to uh, to uh, uh, violence, no better deterrent to uh, um, any of these evils that brought brought all of all of those deaths about than the voice of the victim. I think the voice of the victim is very very important. And there are some I'll I'll never forget listening one morning. I was listening to uh, I think it was the Nolan show. No, we don't get that down south, but I live in Cork now. But I could hear somebody rang me and said it turn on the internet and you can hear the, this, there's a discussion on about the, the troubles. And there was this lady and she came on and she apparently she had been on the day before and she had been talking about her husband who was killed 40 or 50 years be prior to that. And um, I hadn't heard that particular uh, um, conversation, but she unusually she was back on the following day and she came back on to say thanks very much to the presenter. Uh, for having her on and she said the reason I want to thank you for having me on yesterday she said because before I was on your program yesterday I was nobody and my husband was nobody but since I spoke on the program she said I am somebody and my husband is somebody and I, I felt guilty because I mean ours is a very high profile case and the rock and roll element in our thing you know it, actually gets the attention of people generations in the future all because there's always this this uh, rock and roll rebel type of connection that you you know young people have 
So we have that advantage. But I remember feeling very guilty listening to that lady and thinking to myself, you know, I'm taking it for granted that, uh, that our story is well known. So whenever I speak about, about these things now, I also like to remind people that, you know, I'm, o I'm only one of over three and a half thousand people, you know, when it came to, to, to people who were killed, but there was 44, 45,000 people injured in that. So if by telling my story, uh, if, if that makes somebody stop and think, you know, there's a better way to do this, there's a better, let, let's, let's talk about it, it's not going to be easy. So the difference, the journey that I've had from being this, uh, you know, couldn't care less about what was happening just up the road from us, to, to where I am now, uh, uh, I'm a slow learner, but at least I think, I think uh, it's important, my journey is important. So the base pair is that journey, it's the story, the, the, the new book which will be out at the end of this year, it's the story of the journey and the arc. Uh, of the journey and where and and and, and how I got here, uh, so I hope uh, I hope that I hope that'll be my legacy. You know, this particular book, the base. Well, we'll be all be looking forward to, to reading that, Steve. Thanks. Once Steve. again, want to thank you for coming to Belfast. It's always good to have you here. It's, great, it's always great to be in Belfast. <laughs> thank you, Thanks, Sean. And that does it for another week. We'd like for you to join the conversation by sharing the link to today's programme to help us grow our audience across all our social media platforms. I'd once again like to thank our special guest Steve Travers. In the meantime, the conversation will be back next week with more investigations and analysis. I'm Sean Murray. Bye for now.